Now we're going to go uh, South African British. <laughs> My English. Prudence Margaret Leith. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, you are. Uh, it's a it's a big it's a big name, Prudence. And it became just Prue. Prue. Well I never liked Prudence. I mean, who wants to be prudent? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? My mother nearly called me Faith Leith. And can you imagine that mouthful, Faith Leith? She liked these sort of virtues, you know, yes. like faith and hope and charity and stuff. So I'm glad I got prudence because at least I could shorten it to Prue. <laughs> and especially for the Afrikaans people going Faith Leith. Prue the, in Afrikaans the, means taste. Uh, that's it? the exactly. thing. It's just well, amazing. That's fine. That's what I mean. <laughs> and, and, and just to, to introduce you properly, I mean, You've, you are an entrepreneur, you're a chef, you've got chef schools, you've got, you're a TV presenter, um, you're world famous. Um, uh, so we're going to go get through all of that. But you were born in Cape Town. I was, Rondebosch. In Rondebosch. Wow. Yeah. But you, you went to school in Joburg yeah. with the Anglican nuns. Is yeah, that why you yeah. so, I mean, you, there's no scandals with you. Is that the reason? <laughs> we searched. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for scandals. I, I was at St Mary's. Um, no, I mean, I, I wasn't mad about school, to be honest. I think mm. St. Mary's is a really good school now. Mm. At the time, it was, um, uh, well, it was, I mean, it did me well. It got me a first-class matric, so I can't complain. But mm. it, I, I wasn't really made out for school. I wanted not to be in school, basically. That's beautiful. But then your first memory of food as well mm. was when you were six years old and it yeah. involving... A birth and a banana. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a beautiful it's, story. It's, it's a crazy story. My brother was being born in my mother's bedroom, and I was being operated on, on the kitchen table for an abscess in my ear. And when I came round, my nanny said to me, you've got a baby brother, do you want to see him? And I said, no, I want a banana. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's sort of been my life, really. I'll always choose food above anything else. <laughs> and it worked for you. It worked out quite well. Yeah. Um, so you just admit now that you said your school wasn't for you and you studied in Cape Town, yeah. um, but you didn't finish. And then you went to even the Sorbonne. And everyone's looking. I mean, I was in France four years ago. For me, just seeing the name, was yeah. good enough. Yeah. Going like, oh, that's, and the song is about this. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. that famous song? Um, uh, the, the one that's getting a tan. I'll get the song now in, in the <laughs> break. Yeah, back. yeah, and singing, you studied at the Sorbonne. <laughs> and then, but, but uh, still, there you, you fell in love with food. I did. So, uh, but first, why did you go overseas? You just Well, curiosity. I mean, to be honest, at Cape Town University, I did not know what I wanted to do. Mm. And I, because my mother was an actress, mm. I thought I'd be an actress. So I, went to drama school and I wasn't any good at acting, so I went, I thought I'd go to art school and I was terrible at art. So I kept changing. But also I have to say I spent more time on Clifton Beach than I did in lectures. <laughs> so, um, Normal. Uh, so at the end of two years, I um, managed to persuade my long-suffering father that I would learn French better if I was in France, taught by the French. So I went off to France. And then, of course, I lost interest in Bonaparte and Baudelaire and got very interested in Boeuf Bourguignon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just fell for food. And I thought it was interesting because all the time in South Africa, I had grown up in a very sort of middle class, um, northern suburb, Johannesburg family. Um, and we had a wonderful Zulu cook. And I could have learnt at his apron strings. Mm. But it never occurred to anybody to put to suggest I went into the kitchen. I just didn't do it. Lovely food arrived on the table. We ate it. He's probably responsible for my greed because mm. I loved eating. But I never occurred to me that I might be able to do that cooking. But mm. when I got to France, I realised everybody talked about food. Everybody was interested in food. And so it became sort of OK to, be, to like food. Mm. And just to surprise people, because, I mean, I don't know, you know if someone's watching now and I don't know you, but you are turning 80, 80. next week. week. I mean, 80, yeah. you don't even look 60. No. I'm not oh, lying. you're a lovely guy. No, I'm, I'm, I think she, we all say. Really? Uh, we all love. Like, we're all lovely. Yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. Um, no, but you know what? It's just it amazing. Is true. I mean, people quite often say to me, you don't look 80, yeah, which yeah. I'm very glad I don't. And is it Botox or is it? But no, I mean, the truth is that I think I've had a really happy life. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a a really bad life or unhappy life, or it, it does show on your face. Mm. And I think I don't, I sleep very well and I eat well, very well. I mean, you know, and you enjoy it. And I really enjoy <laughs> myself and life. And I have 
quite a lot of energy, which I think comes from the sleeping and the eating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I'm really, really happy. Mm. So, you know, I think I'm, I'm just incredibly lucky and I'm really, am I, I, I should be grateful because I've had a great life. Mm. I've had, you know, great success in my business. My, I've written a lot of novels and they've mm. sold and cookbooks and they've sold and I've had a good career in catering. I made enough money, my children are healthy, mm. my grandchildren are lovely. I have nothing to complain about. So That's amazing. And it's, and it's, uh, you said something I can't remember where um, about depression, to say, yeah. I mean, it's something you totally understand because it's in your brain mm. and serotonin. Mm. And, and you were just kind of blessed with, with waking up and realizing, and even if something bad happens, you just see it as an opportunity. You go like, oh, it happens, let's try another thing. Yeah, no, I do. I do think that, um, that an awful lot of my luck is, is just that I have that sort of chemistry in my brain that makes me fairly optimistic mm. and glass half full rather than glass half empty. Mm. And I mean, some people just, it's not their fault that they're depressed. Mm. It's the serotonin levels in mm. there that does it. Mm. But if you're depressed, you make everybody else miserable and you're miserable and it's sort of downward spiral. Mm. But so, I generally think, oh, it'll all be all right. You yeah, know, and it's, it's working. Okay. <laughs> uh, we were all excited about Jan's Michelin star, the sh uh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Afrikaans boyki from, from South Africa in Nice. Yeah. And then uh, it's just amazing, 1969, you know, having a restaurant in Notting Hill. We know the movie. <laughs> we enjoyed the movie a couple of years ago. Yeah. You were there in 1969, opening a restaurant, yeah. getting Long a Michelin star. Yeah. Long before the movie. Yeah. Um, and then that's where the, um, you know, your, your first food and wine school mm. started that mm -hmm. you sold. I mean, what do you see as your first break? Because that's where the business starts. You know, even that restaurant, Leith's, you, you sold that. But it's like, you know, like capital. Or did you think you're an entrepreneur? How did it happen? Yeah. No, I, I just basically grabbed opportunities as they came along. Mm. And I think my first break was, funnily enough, a tiny little one. I think l lots of breaks ha happen, you know, in, in your life and some, some steps backwards. And, but I've had more steps forwards than backwards. So. But I was, when I started, I was going around cooking people's dinner parties. And I was cooking this woman's party in, um, she was in a posh part of London. And... I heard her through the hatch, because they were in the dining room and I was in the kitchen. I heard her, um, a, a guest saying to her, this food is absolutely delicious, you must be, give me the name of the cook. And she said, oh, no, no, she's just here for the washing up. She said, I did all the cooking. And I was absolutely furious. I wanted to fling open the catch and say, no, 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 I did the cooking. But what I did was I put my little cards, printed cards, in all the guests' pockets, which were hanging in the hall, the coats, with a little note saying, your dinner was cooked by. And the next oh. morning, a chairman of a, of a big publishing company rang me up and said, the dinner was delicious and your marketing skills are amazing. <laughs> Will you come and work for me? Will you come and do our director's dining room? Thing? So that sort of break mm. is, I mean, I sort of made it myself by, by instead of getting cross, by thinking, mm. I'm going to turn this to my advantage. Mm. So I think, and I'm quite, I'm quite adventurous. Mm. No, that's a fantastic plan. We're going to talk with Brew Leith, and you can also, as you've missed the first part, on our YouTube channel. So, we into TV. I've been on TV for 20 years. I think it's fantastic, and it's actually ridiculous. Because you were on TV before I was born. 1970 started with, with TV. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. We didn't even have TV in South Africa then. Yeah, um, and yeah. Even that door, how did that all open for you? Um, well, just a friend was a presenter, and she, so she, um, she, they were doing some colour tests mm. for colour television. I mean, I'm that old. It was black and white when we started. And so I had to go in and do a bit of cooking for four minutes. And they didn't have a proper um, cooker. They just had four rings painted on a table, and I had to pretend to cook. And, the, <laughs> and it, it actually was broadcast, but it wasn't um, advertised, so... It went out in the morning when there was no television in the morning. And there I, was I just trying to say, when the butter is sizzling, you add the onions. And the butter wasn't sizzling. A great lump of it was sitting in this cold pan. I mean, it was, I thought, I hate television. This is all fake and horrible. And I didn't do it for years. And then I did, I did start doing telly. I, had, I presented a show when I was very young mm. in the 70s. There's pictures of me with 
hippie beads and sequins and long hair. <laughs> <laughs> but then I didn't do it for a long time because I didn't really enjoy it. Mm. And then I came back to do the great British menu, which I loved because mm. it was chefs. And, mm. and, and then, of course, and I do Great British Bake Off, mm. which is the, the loveliest job anybody could possibly have. Mm. You walk onto set, you eat cake. And, and you get paid quite you, well. You say what you like. <laughs> You walk off and you get paid very well. Yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. What's wrong with that? <laughs> and that's a British thing because mm -hmm. in South Africa, it, it, I think it's only Rian Kruijwoch and it lasted more than 20 years on TV and Johan Stemmet. But, I mean, you can there's 10 people. Yeah. Whereas yeah. in Britain and even America, someone like Parkinson, I mean, uh, Parkinson, he, he was on TV. Yeah, but it was Parkinson, his surname. Mm -hmm. It was just a slip Michael. of the tongue. Michael. Michael Parkinson. And it was he, he was on TV for years. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 David Attenborough. You know, and I think that's the difference. We don't have that culture here yeah. to realise uh, uh, on in 75 you can get another job. Yeah. Um, so for you, the, the experience in terms of uh, writing books, you know, the TV yeah. Yeah. and then the cooking books and then taking a break saying, listen, I'm going to do novels. That's just worlds apart. I know, but I'd always, I'd always written stuff. Um, mm. When I was in Paris, I wrote for the Johannesburg Tatler. There used to be such a thing as the Johannesburg Tatler. And I used to write a column for it when I was a student. Um, and so I'd always written um, non-cooking stuff. And then when I got to England, I started writing more cookery. And I wrote for a wine, um, Berry Brothers and Rudd. I, they, they had a, a little leaflet that I wrote the recipes for and so on. And then I, so I kept writing cookbooks and doing a bit of journalism. And, and then I kept thinking, I want to write this novel, which had been buzzing around in my head for years and years. And I realized that if I didn't sell the business and stop writing cookery, I would never write the novel. I'd just go on thinking about it and not do it. Mm. So then when I was heading for 50, I sold everything. And I stopped writing cookery. I said, I'll never write another recipe. And I wrote eight novels and a memoir. Mm. And, um, and then I got pulled into t food telly. And then that made me more interested in recipes and what was how food was changing. And, it, and it's so different now than it was then. So, of course, I wanted to get back into it. So then I wrote a cookbook called Prue, um, which is available here too. And then I've just, about, I've just written a vegetarian cookbook mm. called The Vegetarian Kitchen. But actually, I wrote one of them. I mean, I wrote a vegetarian book 25 years ago. Mm. And the publisher said... Can't use that word. Can't use that word vegetarian. Mm. It'll, it, nobody will buy a book with the word vegetarian on mm. it. So we didn't. We called it something else. So it's really nice now that there's this whole vegetarian movement. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm a great sort of advocate for, for veg because I think we make a mistake of just thinking, um, especially in this country, we're such a meat eaters, South Joe, Africa. Love we know. love our braai and so on. So veg is a kind of extra. You know, you might put a mealy on the braai, but you, uh, veg doesn't take centre stage. And we need to realise that veg, if it's properly treated, tastes absolutely wonderful. It's mm -hmm. You can get tremendous flavour and, and deliciousness out of ve vegetable dishes. Mm. So um, I, I'm all for people eating... I'm, I'm a carnivore. Mm. Um, my fellow author, um, Peter Leith, she's my um, niece, she's a real vegetarian, but I just like veg. Mm. So I want to promote it, but I would always um, leave some place... Uh, some part of my diet mm. carnival because you know but i'd rather have meat twice a week that's really good meat mm. you know grass-fed beef and chicken that hasn't been so cruelly treated as farm you know the factory farm mm. and it tastes better mm. and then if you just if you do that it's cheaper because veg is cheaper and you can spend the extra money on better quality meat. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> what, what I pick up, and I think maybe that's also part of your success, is the honesty. Mm. Um, whether, like now, mm. you, you talked about writing a vegetarian book, but you say, I, I love meat. Yeah. And the same with your, with your novels, yeah. you know, uh, with, with your daughter that was adopted. You've got a great view of adoption and your late husband also was adopted. Yeah. But, you know, writing a story about adoption, yeah. Um, and I think that's the honesty. Is that just a natural thing for you? I mean, you really share 
What do you believe? I, I'm a terrible blabbermouth. I'm very mm. indiscreet. I mean, mm. you should never, ever tell me a secret because the chances are <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let it out. You, you've got to tweet it. <clears throat> yeah, I know. No. Like I went and treated the winner one year. Yeah. Of, 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 oh, that was that was just the worst. It was, just six, it was just six hours so too awful. early. It's not that bad. Oh, well, it, it turned out not to be too bad because, in fact, I think it got so much publicity. I mean, every single newspaper led with a headline that Prue Leith has... has um, you know, let out the win it was leaked the winner's name. Um, and there was so much publicity that lots of people who'd never watched Bake Off before All of suddenly a thought, oh, well, well, there's such a fuss about it. I better, we better watch it. So it actually didn't do the ratings any harm. <laughs> at yeah, all. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so they forgave me. Yeah. Everybody forgave me. And just uh, interesting that, that you, both your children, they're still Kruger because your, your first husband was, mm. was a Kruger from South Africa. Yes, Rain Kruger. Yeah. Rain Kruger still, uh, um, he wrote a wonderful book on the Boer War called mm. Goodbye Dolly Gray. Sure. And um, so he was quite well known in South Africa. But he was 20 years older than me and he died about 18 years ago. Mm. And, um, but the children, of course, have kept his name. I love the name. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Danny, as you say, is now my, uh, he's now an, an MP in England, mm. he's a politician. He's been in politics all his life, you know, writing for um, Tory politicians. He's a sort of compassionate Tory. He's always trying to make the, the Conservative Party less right-wing and less um, unattractive, you know, mm. he wants. So he's done a lot of stuff in charities and so on. He's a, he's a lovely guy, I'm very proud of him. Mm. And, and, and your daughter, she's more also into creativity. Yes, she's very creative. She's mm. a filmmaker. Filmmaker, yeah. And we've both been, we've just come back from Cambodia where mm. we made a, two, a film for Channel 4 about her adoption mm. and get, her getting out of Cambodia, which was during the killing fields um, yeah. with Khmer Rouge, slaughtered everybody. Sure. You know, they slaughtered a quarter of the population. Sure. Oh, it's amazing. And, um, and anyhow, she escaped as a baby. And um, so we went looking for her birth. Um, you know, we just was trying because now you've got we've got DNA testing and mm. all sorts of stuff. So we did manage to find um, a third cousin. So that was very exciting. Well, sure. Um, we didn't find her parents or anything, but mm. we, you know, it was just interesting to go to the village where the family came from. Mm. And so. You, you see, Angelina Amazing thought she was stories. first, and, and uh, <laughs> Charlie Strong <laughs> eat your heart out. You know, I mean, we've got someone famous all these years. Um, we're going to talk about the business. I know she's got a, a political question for you, Elsa, and we're wow. going to talk uh, spectacles. We're going to talk about and you can the rest of the on YouTube channel. Uh, we want to talk a bit business, and just taking it from, from your family or your son being in politics. Um, and then you being a director, it's big companies. I mean, British Rail, uh, Woolworths, uh, Halifax. It's just, I mean, it's, it's a big business side. And when I, when I mentioned the business, uh, uh, you know, the combination of creativity and business, Elsa just came up with the best question. What's that? So I would like to find out, I mean, uh, as a very successful businesswoman, as a matter of fact, I think we can refer to you as a tycoon. Um, <laughs> what are your views in terms of Brexit and the economy? Is it good or bad? Do you know what? I think we'll be fine. Okay. I mean, it may be just that I am fairly cheerful natured. And I did think at the time, um, I, I, you know, there are good arguments on both sides. And, oh. and that argument, it was just so awful that it couldn't be held in a civilized way. You know, everybody started hating everybody else, which was awful. But I think it'll be absolutely fine. I mean, after all, we were, we haven't always been in Europe. And we have done in ma amazingly better than the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, not only while we were in, but, but since we've been saying we're coming out, all the remainers have said, oh, it'll all, you know, the, the economy will go to hell, the share price will fall, GDP will fall, unemployment will increase. None of these things have happened. And I don't think they will. I mean, even if we do take a little bit of a setback, there are, you know, it's like this country. We are full of young entrepreneurs. And when people make stuff, they will find a market to sell it. Mm -hmm. And France, it's very interesting to see what the Europeans are now saying. And all the time they said, well, you know, if you leave, we'll never speak to you again. We won't trade with you and we'll punish you. Now they're saying, 
we need to make a good deal because they want to sell our stuff, mm -hmm. their stuff to us, and they sell more to us than we sell to them. Mm -hmm. So I am totally cheerful about it. I mean, I suppose I would be pretty cheerful if we'd stayed because I think we'd muddle through. But you know what? European Commission is corrupt. Mm. And they've never had their accounts um, cleared by their auditors in the entire time they've been there. Mm. And I wouldn't back a company whose accounts aren't clean. Mm. If, Money you... just disappears in yeah. Europe, and we should do something about it. It's, it's one of my broad stories, now, and I don't have an opinion on Brexit, but on corruption, I, I do. We, we lose about 30 billion rand in South Africa a year. The European Union, with 13 countries, loses about 130 euros gone. Mm. Uh, corruption, education, maintenance, mm. it disappears. It's, it's and it, and it's, that's the thing. So people think this, oh, it's perfect. It's not. But luckily, we've got a trade agreement still with you mm. because we're going to sell your glasses in South Africa. Good. That's your trademark. <laughs> and it's such an interesting story. I mean, the one you've got on is, is your absolute trademark. And mm. that was actually hand-painted all these years, but very expensive. And mm. then you decided, but... Again, another door opening as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So just a little bit of background with the, I call it spectacles. Well, I've always worn, I've always liked bright colours. Yeah. And um, to be honest, uh, since I've done so much more television in the last few years, more and more people have said to me, where do you get your glasses? Where do you get your necklaces? And so on. And, and the businesswoman in me immediately thinks, ah, oh, there's, there's... There's a know, door. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's money to be made. So I thought, well... The, the glasses that I was wearing are made by a lovely company called Ronit First. Mm. And, but they were handmade, hand-painted, and they were expensive. Mm. And I like to have different colored glasses to go with different mm -hmm. um, outfits. And so I went to them and said, hey, could we do a cheaper range, um, a more affordable range? And, um, and they said, well, actually, we were just thinking about doing exactly that. So it was as smooth as anything, and I really like Ronit. She does all the designing. Mm. Um, but I have a hand in the colours and, you know, the pre presentation of boxes and so on. And now we've got them in South Africa, so oh. it's brilliant. And they're selling really well in England. So maybe try one, Elsa, yeah. as a model. OK. Let's see. Uh, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's available all over South Africa? Yes, it is. Okay. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know all the shops, but I know yeah, that they are... Google and go to the website. Yeah, they're... they're How about this one? It's all independent optometrists, yeah. not um, yes. not the big chains. Yes, yes. Um, oh, and that's then, great. And then, you look yeah. good in there. Yeah, you look really Thank good. You so Professional. Much. Mm. I'm on board. Thank you. I'll <laughs> take that. I'll take and, that. And then your cookbook also, um, in the whole week, mm -hmm. this week is your birthday celebrations, although it's next week. Um, I'm going to attend the lunch. I can't wait. But, you know, there's a lot of things happening. Yeah. Um, and, and your book's also available everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. The, vegetarian the Vegetarian Kitchen one yeah. and also Prue. Yes, it's also available. Yes, Prue and the vegetarian. Okay, and then we've got some quick questions. I want to know um, your most prized possession that is not human. Uh, because, I mean, you'll go with my, my, my husband and my children. And um, no, oh, I see, no. Have a my most prized possession is probably a tapestry, okay. a French. Um, it's just a big piece of art. And, and I bought it in France years ago, and it was so expensive. But, you know, my husband often says... An extravagance is never regretted. Mm. But if you don't buy something when you really, really want it, you spend the rest of your life thinking, I should have bought it. Mm. That is a fact. <laughs> and so I love this tapestry. It's by, by an artist called Catalan. Mm. Um, he's not particularly well known, but it's beautiful. Mm. And then the typical questions. I want to know your favourite fruit, veggie, and then meat. Mm -hmm. My favourite fruit is um, uh, what we would call passion fruit and you'd call granadilla. Okay. And we used to grow it on the back fence in South Africa when I was a child. And we could, you couldn't buy it in the shops because everybody grew it on their back fences. Now, of course, it's, you could buy it anywhere. And um, so I grew up with that and I love it. And what was the next one? Veggie? Veggie, probably aubergine. Oh, oh wow. Eggplant, yeah. brinjals, yeah. you call them, don't yeah. you? Yeah, mm. uh, I mean, they are so um, adaptable. You know, mm. they absorb garlic or olive oil or... They absorb flavours very, very well, and they have a great flavour themselves, and you can do anything with them. So mm. I like aubergine. And, and meat. meat. Well, you know what? I've just met a new thing, and it's got an Afrikaans name, and I don't know what it is, but I think it means little turtle or something. But it's actually lamb oh, liver. Oh, skull pikes. 
Yeah. Yeah, a little doodle. Skull pikey. Skull pikey. Skull pikey. It's oh, one of my favorite I had stuff. it for the first time um, oh, no. in Cape Town at a braai. And it's wrapped up in coal, isn't yes. it? And it is just delicious. So I want a recipe. I want Look to at that. that it. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, and I think that's a speciality for, oh. it's, it's uh, you know, like if you really get to a butcher, yeah. uh, everyone's different. Yeah, it's yeah. not mass produced. Not so, specialized. Yeah, it's a specialized thing. And it's for me, it's one of my fun things to do is to try different ones because it, it differs. It's also, good. your favorite ingredient? I suppose Love. at the moment, I think ginger. Mm. But mm. it changes, ginger. you know, fashions come and go. Mm. And I've, I've got a sort of, um, my um, family say that I, that I've been, since I learned how to get pomegranate to pieces, you know, when you're trying to take all those little seeds out there. They explode all over the front of your dress, and they and they're difficult. But if you do it underwater, you can sort of ease them out, and the, what happens is the seeds go to the bottom, and sink, and all those horrible bits of pith which get in the way all the time float to the top. So this is your tip tip of the day. So my fam since I learned this trick, um, my family do accuse me of putting pomegranates on everything, you know, on <laughs> roast lamb, mm. on salads, on top of pudding <laughs> top of cakes <laughs> everything uh, we don't want to let you go but we have to Pro oh. what a privilege oh. mm. that was fantastic That'd been really I good would time. have you for three hours on TV oh, thank I'd you so much here. Yeah, we're proud of you as South Africans huh? a lot yeah, thank thanks you. for visiting thanks. us welcome to the Groot Ontbijt YouTube channel if you net not from what you've seen it, well click on the playlist and onthou ons uh, hou you on the van sake and voeg dagelijks nieuwe video material by so as you dit graag wil see Klik op die subscribe knopje. Kom, klik. Meis. Ja, ja, daar zijn, daar in. Subscribe, daar zijn.